Hi, I'm Terry Leverett, president of Prepare the Way. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Her name is Glenna Callan. She has expertise in her field. She comes to this with a master's in home economics and nutrition. Thank you. My goal is to help you um, work through some ideas for home food preservation. Automatically, when you talk about it, people think about canning, but I honestly don't believe for many people that's the best option. There are some other things that singles, small families, people without gardens can do before they jump to a pressure canner. So we're gonna look at some of those things. Freezing obviously is another option, but if we're talking about a power outage situation, we're not gonna look at that. So we will focus on pressure canners, boiling water bath, and then dehydrating, which is another great option. So what I'm going to do, I will tell you when it comes to canning, home canning, I'm a purist, which means I'm overly, overly cautious. You know, my background was home ec, um, and then I actually took a canning class with an, an extension agent just this summer just to see what had changed because I'd been updating my materials and I, but I just had questions. You know, people would ask, um, you know, they'd want to home can maybe a soup or some convenience food. And you'd pick up one book and it would give directions and another book would say no, you know, and I was always like, okay, tell me, is it safety or is it um, just the quality of the product? because that makes a difference. If it's quality of product, let me worry about that. If it's safety, I want to know. So um, I took a class for one thing, and then I started just asking questions because somewhere all this information trails back to original source. And I found out that that source is the University of Georgia. They are the USDA testing lab. So if you'll pull up the slide for that, um, we'll just need a couple. I want you to be able to write down, yes, that is the, and you can just leave that up a while, that is the website for the University of Georgia, and they have freebies all over it, they have video, they have recipe sheets, they have creative recipe sheets, they have all kinds of stuff, and then they also have a book that, um, $15 or so, available on their website. But that's where all, like Missouri Extension, where K-State, where all of them get their information, okay? Starts at University of Georgia. They do the testing. Now, Ball, you've heard of Ball Jars, um, and the Ball Blue Book, which, you know, is, is considered a standard, too, and it is. And they are inexpensive, like, I think, $5.95. This is the newest one. I probably have every one of them since the 1980s somewhere. And they all have different pictures and different styles. Um, I will tell you this new one is more and more, it seems like about advertising their products where it used to be like for, um, you know, there's a fruit fresh uh, or citric acid or ascorbic acid you use to keep things. Well, they like for you to do, use their products. So it's getting more and more that way. So they, are, they use the correct standards, okay? But if you want something that gives you more options, if you want to pay a little more, you could go back with this. And then Ball also has this, this is just for fun stuff mainly, like all the fancy salsas, condiments, pickles, things, but it's also considered a standard. So this is the basic, and then these go above and beyond if you want to get real creative. And then you know what, the extension offices have free materials too, and you can download. I, I haven't looked with Kansas as much, but I know the University of Missouri has tons of free uh, recipes and directions for canning, all sorts of things. And again, they follow the lab testing from that. So I'm going all around that whole circle to, because I have a feeling many of you have heard mixed things about canning, and perhaps you're a little nervous about it because of those things you've heard. And um, there are still some horror stories that I hear from time to time. But if you just follow the rules, it's very safe, very simple. So what I think I'm going to do is um, I'm going to focus today on, on these, this type of canning and on food dehydrating. And then, um, like I said, freezing we're not going to look at because of, of just the issue with power. But know that anything I tell you is standard, okay? I'm not gonna, 
the, you know, some people have done it, things in their ovens, or they've done things in the microwaves, or they've done, you know, all sorts of other things, and, and I'm not even going to go there. So just so you know that, what you hear from me is going to be the standard. It's just, I just don't want to take that risk. And um, in your own home, you know, you make your own choices, but I'm going to do it as accurately and as safely as possible. So let's do a table tour here and then I'll, I'll get into some of the basics and kind of walk you through it. How many of you have done home canning of like green beans? Okay, I figured that, yeah. Salsa. And salsa, oh yes, yeah. And tomatoes, yes. Um, pardon? <laughs> oh, chutneys, yes. Um, all of those, those, those specialty foods are just really, really fun. And uh, the bear, when the berries are ripe, you know, the jams and jellies, and those things are super simple. Lots of options there. My advice to you is to think about what your family could use quantity of and think what you have available to you. Because if you're having to go to a farmer's market or somewhere and pay full price for, like, say, green beans, um, now, again, I have to hedge this. If they are organically grown and that's important to you, then, then it's worth it, okay? But if you're just going because you, could, you want a can and, and you're purchasing them and then you're gonna, money-wise, you're just not gonna come out. There's just no way on earth. Time-wise, you're not gonna come out. So you really have to look at that. For um, single, fan, like I, I think I mentioned this before, but for singles or people who don't have access to food, you can dehydrate quickly, cheaply, and then vacuum seal and be done with it much safer, you don't have to baby it or any of that. But, um, but you know, canning also has its good features. And it is one of those things that you can put up a lot of food quickly. You can um, do convenience foods, you can do those salsas and things that there's just no way to capture the taste any other way. So don't, don't think I'm trying to be negative about it. I just want you to be aware it's not the only option. This canner has been in active use since 1978. Can you tell? It's a, it's a good one. And then it is a heavy one. The new Prestos are not this heavy. And then the, the newest, the deluxe model, is the All-American. You may have seen those. And they don't have gaskets. So um, that's the feature that's so good about them. But this one has been good. And I, on, on these, these old ones are wonderful. What you need to do if you find one somewhere is be sure and have it tested so that you know that the gauge is accurate and that everything's working properly. And extension agents will do that. Ours do it for free. So I have replaced the gauge on this, and then every few years I have to replace this gasket. But it has worked very, very well. This is the size I like. It holds seven quarts or nine pints. I just, you know, there are the big ones that hold a lot more than that, but I, to get that much produce ready to can at one time is just like overwhelming. And by the time I get seven quarts of green beans ready to go, I mean, that's all I want to deal with that day. You know what I'm saying? So it's, again, look at the size of your family. Look how many hands you have preparing food. And the larger ones may be overkill. Um, this is a real normal average size. Works well. Okay, so you've got a canner. The fear is always that they'll blow up. You hear that? Okay, it just doesn't happen. There are all these safety features on them, and you know, I don't, I don't know where that has come from. It probably happened to somebody, and it was traumatic enough that everyone talks about it. Probably the greater danger is someone who's not processed something properly and botulism. In fact, when you look at pressure canning, there are charts that show, you know, what, like Rod went through that whole thing, you know, this is killed, or this is filtered out at this stage, this at this stage. Well, with canning, it's by temperature. So certain things like enzymes are killed at, I think that's 140 degrees, and, and then you have, um, I want to tell you accurately, you have um, bacteria or molds and yeasts that are killed, and then you have bacteria, most of them around 160. But there is one, it's, it's the botulism bacteria that thrives on low acid, anaerobic, which means no air. So in a, a jar of something that's canned, green beans are the classic example, canned, the air is removed, green beans are low acid. If there was the botulism bacteria present, it could thrive in this. And it's deadly, 
okay? That's really the only thing you have to worry about. Anything else, the lid pops off or you get, it's slimy or it's not, it's nasty. You wouldn't eat it anyway. Botulism, you cannot tell. So the only thing you have to do is follow the directions. I mean, honestly, it's, they, they're overkill on directions. You follow the directions, it's not an issue. But that is the one big foodborne illness that is serious and that you do have to pay attention to. So when they tell you for the low acid foods, like the green beans, potatoes, any of those vegetables, particularly meats, obviously, dry beans, any of those things, to do it a certain way, just be sure you follow those rules. And I will tell you this, I, I went to this, um, this extension class with green beans and this lady does the judging, this extension agent, the judging of the Missouri State Fair. And um, so I was, I was just playing ignorant, you know, like I was just going through this the first time. And uh, one of the first things she said is, and do not fancy pack your green beans. And I was like, fancy pack, what is that? She said, oh, like when you try to put the whole green beans in to make them look pretty? She would not even approve this. And the reason being, she says, now, mine are loose enough that they'll move around, but she said the product is too dense in the middle that you can't get penetration of the heat. Okay, so in that case for my family, I'm willing to take the risk because I know what was in them. But um, she would not have approved that. So again, they are really meticulous with their directions. Okay, um, that's the one thing you really need to remember. And then when it says to do pressure canner, do pressure canner. If it says to do the boiling water bath, do boiling water bath. I talk with my hands and I'm just terrible about these things. All right, um, the other big debate with canning is always the jars. And I didn't bring, I guess, a quart, well, this is a quart jar, a quart wide mouth jar. This is a pint and a half formerly sandwich spread. Okay, keep that in mind. This is a standard pint, standard half pint, jelly, usually used for jelly jars. Okay, so the debate rages on, can you use these former other purpose jars? Have you heard that debate before? For canning. And this particular one was like sandwich spiral. I like to do applesauce in these. It's just the perfect amount. And this is what they're saying. First, they used to say never, never, never. And most of us who did canning thought that's because um, they were being bribed by the jar makers. <laughs> well, actually what they're saying now is that you may use these former mayonnaise jars, although I think they're all plastic now, aren't they? But if you have access to them, but they often will not stand up to the long temperatures, long, high temperatures and long processing in a pressure canner. They're more prone to breakage. We all knew that, didn't we? <laughs> so fine for boiling water bath, fine for things you're pressuring five to 10 minutes, which might be tomatoes sometimes. But for longer things, they recommend you use the standard tempered glass jars, okay? But they're actually saying that now, which I think is interesting. Um, and then you can freeze in these and, and do other things. Okay, and then the other big debate that's raging is on lids. And I ask that question too. The standard two-part lid is what you always see. And then there is a new one called a Tatler lid that has been advertised. It's a reusable lid, and you actually use it with one of these rings. So like it was originally on, on here. And, that, and you're careful when you remove them. You can re-sterilize them and use them indefinitely. Occasionally, well, I can't remember after how many uses, it's a bunch, you have to re buy more little rings. These are quite expensive starting out, like 12 of them, six, 69. Now, this was at an Amish store. If you buy them online, they're about a dollar per lid. So they're pretty expensive. But if you're concerned about supply and are wanting to reuse, okay, so the official extension answer to the use of these is they say that they aren't sure they will hold up over long-term heavy canning, that they recommend them for boiling water bath or short time canning, kind of like they do the untempered jars. So, you know, that's a decision you have to make. The harder thing with these is with regular lids, you can tell if they're sealed quite easily, but with these you can't so much until you start to take them off. 
you know, you'll feel it if you're taking them off, but otherwise it's harder to tell. So those are two of the big controversies you're going to hear when it comes to canning things. And, um, you know, some of those decisions you just have to, conclusions you just have to come to on your own. One of the things I like to use a lot is those, those, these plastic lids too. When I've opened something like I've opened salsa and putting it back in the fridge to use. So they're nice to have. You don't can in them, obviously, but for canning purposes. Okay, and then some equipment that's nice, funnels, obviously, jar lifters. There are little magnetic wands, too, that you can use. Um, not a lot of equipment required. Really, your biggest cost investment is going to be your canner and then the jars. And if you have access to jars from perhaps an estate sale or someone in the family, be sure and check them so that the top is free of any kind of nick or crack because that just they're just useless after that unless you just want to use them for you know, short-term storage with this kind of thing. But for canning, you can't, they will not seal. So watch your jars very carefully. But quite an investment. But again, if you have lots of produce coming in, it may be worth it to you. The things I concentrate on are green beans, tomatoes, salsas, applesauce. We get a lot of, you know, when apples are, when they are plentiful, they are everywhere. You know, and you may not have very many for a couple more years, and then they, they cycle in again. So that kind of thing are what I really focus on. So if we're doing green beans, and who said they'd done green beans before? You have. Nobody else? Okay, you have options. So let's, let's say we're going to do some. You have your jar, and I'm going to do them in pints because we're a smaller family. You have choice, hot pack, cold pack on those. Not always do you have that choice, but you can. So you, you wash your produce. And you know they say that the greatest cause of foodborne problems, um, whether it's contamination, possibly disease, but contamination and canning is dirty hands. People are careful about their washing their produce, but their hands, because you're just doing so many different things throughout the course of the process. So clean hands, clean produce. The jars do not have to be sterilized. Um, you can do like um, dishwasher and heat cycle. You can dip them in boiling water if you want to do it that way, hot soapy water. And the, the extension agent that taught the class, she washes hers and then she just sticks them in a 200 degree oven and keeps them warm while she's getting her beans ready. Some way to keep them clean and warm, all right? And the warm is just so you don't have the extremes in temperatures when you're putting them in into heat. So I just break my beans and comfortably stuff them in there. I mean, not crammed in too tight, but just comfortably and then there's always a, a direction for headspace, which means you know how far up you go. You pour boiling water over them. You can salt them or not, depending on your preference. And then you will have had um, hot water poured over your flats that are softening somewhere. You put that on. You put on this lid, comfortably tight and then you're going to dip it down into your canner. Now with the boiling, I mean with the pressure canner, the way they work is there's like an inch, inch and a half of water in the bottom and it has a little um, tray to keep it off the very bottom. So you'll dip them in here and then you will put the lid on sure I have it facing right so that it'll seal. It, it has arrows. And then you tighten it on after, you know, after it's filled. It's, it's boiling, and there's going to start being steam escaping from here. We want the steam to escape for 10 minutes, and that's part of the processing. So let that happen. At the end of that time, we put the, the top on here, and then it will all seal up and then the pressure will start rising. Now, altitude is important with this. Um, here, you know, actually, we live 45 minutes south of here, and we are right at 1,000 feet above sea level. Who would have thought it? It's one of the highest points in this part of the state. So um, pay attention to that. I think all the Kansas City area is fine, but all the charts are given for 1,000 feet or below. So. For the tomatoes, it's 10 pounds, 11, 10 to 11 pounds of pressure for 20, I mean, 
green beans, I'm sorry, 10 to 11 pounds of pressure for 25 minutes for quartz. I think it's 20 for pints, close. I, I always do quartz, so that's what I most remember most um, clearly. So then you do that, all right, then you let the pressure drop by itself. You don't mess with it till the pressure's down to zero. Then you remove this just in case. Whenever you're working with this, always be sure that you open it away from you because steam burns are horrendous. So you open it away after the pressure's all gone and remove the top and then you lift the jars out with the, the jar um, lifter and you'll put them on a counter like on a towel one to two inches apart and let them sit there undisturbed like overnight like 12 to 24 hours they say that's still part of the processing um, even when we did them at that class when we took them home because that was always I was like how is she gonna pull that off where we can take them home well we were instructed not to put them in the refrigerator because they had not completed their sealing process we'd moved them in the middle of it so it's one of those things it's like okay I need space and I need to be able to leave it alone and let it work through its process okay once it has cooled that 12 to 24 hours is over I can I will want to remove this outer lid it's reusable and there's no reason for it to stay on do my labeling store it in preferably a cool dark place if you have that option a dry basement's wonderful they also used to say always use it within one year and you know we were all going really and now they say um, the official s standard is that it will lose some quality after a year but it's still fine to use it if the seal's not broken so some of those things they you know they're they're getting a little more realistic about but again that question is always and always ask this if it comes to it and you don't know what to do is it a quality issue or is it a safety issue and you can call the extension agent in your county wherever you live and get that information mm -hmm. and and again free materials you can um, and they will check your pressure canner for you okay there's also kind of a debate about tomatoes because tomatoes are more low acid now than they used to be see with vegetables and fruits the reason the way you decide which way to do it is based on the acid content fruits are high acid um, tomatoes are borderline green beans potatoes any of those vegetables are low acid and you'll find those you know those charts in any canning book that you would use so low acid you have to pressure can high acid you can do a simpler method called boiling water bath tomatoes are kind of in between um, tested recipes are recommended for salsas or anything uh, they will also tell you that if you're doing a tomato mixture like say you like your tomatoes with green pepper and onion that you need to process for the length of time of that whatever it is that requires the most processing so like I think peppers and onions are 35 minutes or something like that so you would process all of it for that long to cover your bases so that's a general rule of thumb but tomatoes generally they recommend that you add like citric acid or lemon juice or something to raise the acidity before you you would use like a boiling water bath and that's because the varieties are different than they used to be and it's just a safety measure okay so let's say we have a salsa we know it's a tested recipe or we have applesauce or something like that we can use the boiling water bath method and the nice thing with it is you don't have a, to have a specific pot now this thing it's embarrassing my things are so old but th they're well used this is what the cabbage was in and it, it smells like it but they have a rack inside which is kind of nice it doesn't have to have handles I could use this big pot and put some sort of a rack in the bottom I could even use my pressure canner and just not seal the lid on just set the lid on the top so any of those things could be used for a boiling water bath all you have to have is enough height for the water to boil over the top of your jars by an inch 
So you've got to have depth in your container. But other than that, the way this works is you have this pot of water here, and there's a little guesswork on what it's going to take to still cover all your jars. So you'll want another, like a tea kettle or another pan of boiling water. But let's say I'm putting um, um, applesauce in here. I have my jars ready, and I fill, the water's boiling. I put my jars all down in here, return the water to a boil, then I start my timer. And then I, I don't have to stand and watch it. I can just let it, you know, let it process. And the timer's done. There's no pressure to remove. I just remove the jars. Again, put them onto the counter, let them draw, or let them cool, let it seal properly. And when they're cool, I label them and put them away. Now, you've probably noticed it takes a lot of water for canning. It really does. And if you're careful and are not in a huge hurry, you can let this cool and reuse it for something. Um, but if you're working through a lot of things in a row, I mean, you really, you're creating a lot of heat, a lot of steam, and just know that ahead of time when you're making that decision on how to process your food. I have heard people say, you know, they talk about their freezers, they have these freezers full of food, and they go, oh, if the power's out, no big deal, I'll just can it all. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> you might pick certain things that are really important to you to can, but that would be a process. I mean, when, when um, I spent a month this summer just canning just nonstop, and I just thought by the time you get everything ready to can, you get everything clean and all the water it takes and all the, you know, and just the regulation of heat, it's not very realistic to think that's going to happen. It really isn't. It's probably being said by people who've not done much canning. Yeah, really. Um, or any. Right, so when you read that, ask more questions. The other thing about canning that I think they don't tell you is about the, the, what your, your cooking surface. I had an electric range in the farmhouse and I burned, went through burners like one after another on that range because that just was not made to support the weight of a canner. Now the newer canners are not as heavy I realize that now, and that's part of it, but you get a canner full of jars and water, even one of these, there's quite a bit of weight there. And then I also would do large quantities and then freeze parts, like so it was not unusual to have a stock pot going and then break down things to freeze. So I was putting a lot of weight on it. So if you're one that is planning to do that and you have the choice, be sure you get a kitchen range that will support what you're planning to do. The other thing I found is I think gas just is so much simpler to use. Because with gas, I, I know exactly where I can set the burner with this thing, and I can walk away and it never moves. And with electric, you know how they'll, they'll increase, and then they drop down, and they increase. And that's okay, you just have to monitor it more carefully. And then if you have wide ranges in the pressure, you end up losing uh, liquid out of your jars. And so you can have some problems with that. Gas is just easier. So if you're at a point where you know you're going to can and, you, and you're making a change, definitely recommend the gas range. Okay. Let me be sure I've gone through. Um, <clears throat> the primary things to remember are the way you choose how to process depends on the pH or the acidity of the food. Anything like, I don't think I mentioned pickles. Pickles are low acid because the vinegar is added. So like if you're pickling okra, which is, a, you know, okra is a low acid food, but if you're pickling it, it raises the acid. So it's, it's a lower pH, high acid food. Anything pickled, you can boiling water bath. Um, another thing they say is never add thickeners to soups and things before processing. So like if you're using a standard, say a soup recipe in here and you're thinking it's a cream, I don't even know if they, they would permit cream soups, but let's just say they did and you wanted to add a thickener, that's one of the real no-nos. And the reason is because they say they can't test it, the density changes. And like if you're canning meat, you have to be careful about things like trimming fats and there are cert just certain handling things and the reason they do that is because of density and heat transfer within the jar. A lot of times that's what it is. So do follow their rules. Okay, um, I mentioned headspace. 
I mentioned um, some things are raw pack, some are hot pack. And I will tell you that in, in this book, you're going to find it divided. Even this simple little book, great pictures. They go through tomatoes step by step. They go through green beans step by step. They have, because those are, are just the, the ones people always want to can. All the pickle things, everything is there in detail. So it's a great starting place, or if you're thinking about canning and have not done it before, you could get this, look at it, figure out you know, what, what you think you want to work with. I always try to grow garden so that I can do salsa from the garden. So we have tomatoes, garlic, um, jalapeno peppers, and onions. When all those are ready, it's salsa time. So I have a tested homemade salsa that I use with those. And, and you may like doing something like that. It may be important to you. You may be like, eh, I'll just buy it. It's not, you know, I don't eat that much salsa. So really, it's a personal decision. My only advice to you would be to do it safely. Follow the rules. Okay, then the other thing, the thing I most often will recommend people who are getting started with that have small amounts of food, maybe you've been, you have access to a farmer's market and you come home with, you know, peaches. This year was a great year for peaches. And you're like, I have all these peaches. What am I going to do with them? Well, you can do peach jams or jellies, a boiling water bath. You can do, um, oh, you can can peaches, halves or, or slices in a boiling water bath. You can freeze them if you choose to do that. But another thing you can think about is dehydration. And dehydrators come in, there is a round type. Have any of you dehydrated or made beef jerky or something? Yeah. OK. There, there's a round type, and there's the, um, the style I'm going to show you. And this is kind of a mid-level one. The Excalibur is considered the top of the line. And, and I don't have that one, but the, the principles are the same regardless. And so, like, say I'm going to dehydrate something. Basically, all there is to it, you don't have to nurse it like you do a canner. You just, um, depending on your product, and again, there are charts in all these books, you, like, let's say, um, well, I'll just go on and start with one of my favorites. Um, I make fruit leather every summer from, generally, if I have lots of apples, it's three part apples and one part berries. Blend them. I put saran wrap. Now, you can buy fruit leather trays that are like little plastic trays that go on here because it would drip through these. But I just put little pieces of saran wrap on here, rectangular, and I pour some of that pulp from that blended fruit on each side like it, oh, it's probably a quarter inch thick. And I just fill this. And then um, we plug it in, actually, in our solar unit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair, I know. You can, you can um, so it's powered by electricity from solar. You can actually, this summer, you could have built a solar dehydrator and done it outside. And I think I have some pictures of some. Let's just do those now. Of um, Well, that's just that Ball Blue Book website, freshpreserving.com. OK, yeah, come on through those pictures. Um, this is at Echo, Rod mentioned earlier. They do large quantities, and, and they are really focused on helping people without materials utilize what they have to, um, or without very many resources, utilize what they have. So that's a large solar dehydrator. And I think there's another, yeah, something along that for airflow and protect from insects or the basic. There are lots of ideas online. And then, you know, if you have the right spot, you could do that. In Missouri, it seems like when stuff needs to be dried is when our humidity cranks up. And that's why this year has been so odd. We've not had, we could have dehydrated anything outside. And then the next one, that's like grandma's barn. My grandmother used to do that with apple slices on her tin roof. And once again, this year, we could have done it. You would have put cheesecloth or something over the top to keep the flies and things off. But most years, we have way too much humidity, or we won't, won't have enough days in a row, or those days won't come when this produce is ready. So we can't depend on it. So that's why, I mean, this, this better quality dehydrator was around $119. Um, you can go as, I think the Excaliburs are around two. 
you can get the, the round ones without the blowers for like 50 or 60. Um, almost anywhere, especially they, they seem like they sell them a lot or they feature them a lot in the fall during hunting season, at, at like the, the outdoor stores or Walmart, any of those places. So um, I use them for all sorts of things, but the fruit leather is actually our favorite thing. And what I'll do is I explain to you how I would put the fruit on there. And then I'm just going to pull one out with my fingers since I don't have my gloves. But then when it dries up, as it starts to dry, I peel it off that saran wrap and then put it on here and let it finish drying. Now, I did not treat these peaches at all. Anybody who's done peaches know that they turn dark. Well, that's why it's a little bit dark, the oxidation. But all this is is pure peaches that are dried. And it is fabulous. It's like any fruit leather that you would get, only fresher. And then I, I roll it up and, and just put a lid on, put it in jars. Now, if I was going to keep it for more than a year, I would probably vacuum seal or pull the oxygen out. But we eat it too fast for that. We just, it's excellent. Grandchildren love it. I mean, I like things that are family friendly, and this is one that is. So like, say you're at a farmer's market or in your backyard, and you have, you have lots of apples, and you have a few berries. Well, you, three parts apple, one part berries blended is a great thing, no sugar added. This was pure peaches, because we had tons of peaches this year, no sugar added. So we've got pure dehydrated fruit. I mean, how easy is that? It took... I don't know, 12, 16 hours. It depends on how um, thick your, your product is, and it depends on how much liquid there is in it. So things are different, and there are different recommended temperatures. This particular one has an adjustment or a dial on the front. They say like vegetables 125, fruits 135, meats 145 degrees. Sometimes I follow that, sometimes I don't. Meats, you would want the higher temperature for sure. A lot of it, again, if, if I'm doing herbs, they don't take much. If, I'm, if I've got a lot of products in here, like all these are full of fruit leather, then I'm going to rotate my trays because the air in these comes up through the center and there's a blower. Okay, the cheaper models, the air comes up through the center, but there's no blower. So you've got to really rotate those trays to keep even, even um, drying. And the way you know that it's done is you just feel it. It's never going to be as dry as dehydrated commercially. Okay, they are able to pull out a lot more liquid. So you've got to pay attention to it. And if you don't get it dry enough, it'll mold. Okay, you know, we can pay attention to that. It's not going to make you sick, all right? So, um, you have 100% peaches there, healthy, simple. It took very little energy to do it. It could sit on your kitchen counter. It has a low blower fan, um, but it doesn't use a lot of energy. It doesn't put out a lot of heat. It doesn't steam up anything. And like I said, since we have this solar hookup, we just we have an outlet on it in our basement. We just plug it in down there, and, and then I have to remember to go check it and pull the stuff out. Simple, simple, simple and not much investment. Okay, so let's say you've done that. Um, you know, actually the peaches aren't as good as the apples and berries. Apples and berries are just fabulous together. But you can season with um, cinnamon, you can, you, know, you can do all sorts of things to it. And find, again, what your family likes. Okay, so some of the other things I've done, I mentioned a whole head of, we had lots of cabbage too. This is a whole head of cabbage dehydrated. And it was really nice until it sat in the car. Now it's pretty strong. But this is actually from 2011. And what I would do with this is use it in vegetable soup. And you just pull out a little bit, sprinkle it in, it rehydrates naturally. So, so easy. No pretreatment required. You just run it through a slicer, and you can do that by hand. You can do, if you have a food processor type slicer, you can do it that way. Put it on the trays and just forget it, you know, honestly, and check it like, you know, 12 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours. And when it's dry, and vegetables are more crispy, the fruits are more leathery, vegetables are more crispy. And um, 
works well on cabbage. Um, these are onion flakes. Now, I did not do these onions, but you can do onions this way. The reason I brought this was to show you the next step. Like if you want to, you dehydrated something. Notice I just used this cheap plastic lid. But if I was gonna keep it long term, any of you have those, um, those um, vacuum sealer things that you've never used? You know, you need, you do use it. Good for you, that's unusual. Usually people buy them thinking they will and then they don't. Well, what, the plastic bags come with them. And um, Terry and I have had this discussion because he said the plastic will break its seal and he's absolutely right. I have had several that have broken their seal on it. And, and then also, you know, if you're protecting food for long term and you have any issues with mice or any insect issues, anything that could eat through plastic, it would be a problem. So you need to be aware of that. But if you have, um, you're a small family and you want maybe to make some mixes, some fix-ahead mixes, and do them in smaller packages, I would do them in the small package and then put this down inside a bucket with a lid. So you have two layers of protection. Doesn't take much storage space. You can grab and go if you need to with it. Okay, the other thing is those vacuum sealers have, a lot of them have the jar attachment. So the way that works, and I didn't bring the whole sealer because our car was full, but this plugs in it and then it will suck the air out of the jar and then this lid seals on. So I have an airtight seal here. The jar is reusable and my product is safe and I can see it. So it's like, how easy is that? So if you have never preserved anything before, I honestly, that's where I would start. I would, I would find one of these at a garage sale or buy one. They're like $99 or so, the vacuum sealers. Get a dehydrator and then just start looking through those things that you're storing for long term, those things that perhaps you've bought bulk somewhere of something that you know isn't going to keep and you need to break it down. You could do that. You could keep it in jars that way. Or you could, the plastic is kind of expensive. So if you're doing very much, it's nice to do it in jars. And then you can move it to a basement. You can put, if you have the plastic bags, you can store those in buckets. But it just gives you options, many more options. And it's safer. And particularly if you're a person that works during the day and, and um, the idea of getting home at night and canning is just a little over the top. You can put things in your dehydrator and feel safe just letting it run all day, checking it when you get home. So for many families starting out, I just think this is the way to go. And, um, and then, you know, you, the quality, the way you use the food is different, yes. Um, but it's still, it's still adaptable. Um, some tomato varieties are excellent dried. And then you can use them like on salads. You can rehydrate. Um, if you're rehydrating quickly, you would use boiling water over your product. If you're doing it slowly, you could use cold water. If you, with fruits, you can eat them the way they are. You don't have to rehydrate, obviously. Um, you can do like vegetable chips, like cucumber chips, kale chips, um, that kind of thing. You can do powders, like you can dry like the greens or tomatoes or something, get them really dry, blend them, and have a powder. See, there's so many options, and they're all safe, because if there's a problem with any of your dehydrated foods, you're gonna know it. You're just gonna see mold on it, or you know, you're gonna know, and you can just remove that portion and, and either use what's left or, or dry it some more. It's, there's no guesswork involved, which I think sometimes is, is intimidating to people when they do regular canning. Um, some, it used to be that they would recommend doing the dehydrating like in, an, in the oven. And if you read anything that's written a long time ago, and that was when ovens had pilot lights. See, that's the difference. Now we don't. We have those electric ignition bars. And um, so it doesn't work. And if you're on the lowest temperature, there's still just too much variation. And the same microwaves don't work either, unless sometimes for herbs they do. But herbs are so easy to dry that you can even usually hang those in a bunch and just let them dry. A lot of times peppers are that way too, depending on the variety. 
And like I said, this year anything would dry. Um, if you're doing meats, be, do watch that more carefully. Use the higher temperature. Um, if, if the jerky is, is um, dehydrated properly, it can be stored on the shelf. And if you're in question at all, you can store it in the freezer. I mean, just seal it up in, in bags or jars and stick it in the freezer. Like, when you have a freezer, use it. But do know that it will keep quite a while without it, too. Another idea that I've not done yet, we just are constantly challenging each other to try new things. Because we'll read something, you know, and then you forget about it, or you get busy, and you forget. But another thing I just think is a great idea is like when you have leftover soup, like cream soup of some sort, like maybe you made this big thing of potato soup out of Terry's instant potato flakes, and it grew and grew, it was monstrous, and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm sick of eating this stuff, okay? What you do is you, you get your dehydrator out, you put the saran wrap on it like you're doing fruit leather, and you just put spoonfuls of the potato soup, or you could spread it like fruit leather, let it dry, and then when you want just a cup of soup, you either take a little chunk or tear off a little chunk, pour boiling water over it, and you have instant soup. Now how good is that? Inexpensive, just takes forethought. So there are all kinds of things like, you can do that, like that that you can do. Um, sometimes with dehydrating, they will recommend that you dip or pre-treat something, and honestly, the peaches probably should have been because they did oxidize a bit and turn dark, but you can dip them in, um, oh, their products, ascorbic acid mixtures, like the fruit fresh. Sometimes they will have you blanch the food, which is just dipping it briefly in boiling water or steaming it to stop the ripening process, and you just get a better texture and a better product for the long term. So it depends on what it is. And then some fruits, things like blueberries, unless that outer skin is cracked, they don't dry very well. So there's, you'll usually have to do some pretreatment on that too. Um, storage is easy. Um, I have on that fruit leather, there are ideas like three parts apple, one part strawberry. There's like three parts apple, one part rhubarb and strawberry. Um, prunes and apple, apples and pineapple, pears and apple. I mean, apple just is a great extender. And apples are in season now, so you, you can try to look at them if you want. This is the one from the USDA, University of Georgia. And then anything that Ball produces is considered standard because they take from there. And you are welcome to take a look at those things too. But I would really encourage you to try some new things. As long as you have freezer space, you know, you can freeze things temporarily. And then if there's a season when you have more time, you can can then. And you know what I do? I work seasonally. In the summer, it's all about produce. Anything coming out of that garden gets taken care of, okay? But then fall and winter, I pull out my dry beans and make bean soups and can those beans. I'm, I'm going to do meat this fall. You know, I've, uh, that's my new thing I'm going to work on. Um, and I do those things that aren't so time sensitive. So if you have all that produce coming in and you're like, oh my goodness, I can't think of it right now, freeze it temporarily. I mean, some of those things will freeze whole, like strawberries and tomatoes. Just get them in the freezer and then, and then can them in something later. There are all kinds of ways to work it. If you have a freezer now, make it work for you but then you'll want to take it the next step and either can or dehydrate if you're thinking emergency purposes and long-term food storage. Okay? All right, I'll be around for questions should you have any later, and I thank you very much.